yes, Maharaj, so devotees are joining, but this is the regular scheme of joining, so they are joining. So in, in the meantime, you can start with, yeah, Maharaj. Can I share the screen? Yes, yes, Maharaj, please. Okay, so we're on chapter number 16 tonight. I began it last night. Okay, we're studying chapter 16 of the sixth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam at the level of Bhakti Vaibhav. So the 16th chapter is entitled King Chitraketu Meets the Supreme Lord. So the chapter begins, he hasn't met the Supreme Lord yet, but uh, anyway, uh, we're hearing, we were hearing how Narada and Angira had come to meet Maharaj Chitraketu after the death of the son. Maharaj Chitraketu was lamenting a, a lot, the loss of his son, his only son. He'd wanted a son for such a long time, and then when he finally got the son, then after some time the son died. So it was very heartbreaking for Chitraketu Maharaj. And Angira and Narada Muni came there and they gave instruction to him. They gave him transcendental knowledge to understand the different... They gave him transcendental knowledge so he could understand the difference between the body and the soul. And they explained to him, actually, you're not the father. Right? Why, why is Chitraketu not really the father? Who can say? Maharaj, because uh, the body takes different, different births, and every time there are different uh, fathers and mothers who are temporary. And for the soul, there is no like uh, material father. For the soul, there is no what? No material father. Yes, why not? Because um, the material body is temporary and uh, the material relationships are for just one particular lifetime. And when we take next body, we don't even uh, have the, we don't remember who are the, our previous parents because we get a new parents. So that is temporary. Yes, w w but what is eternal? What is not temporary? Our soul is, uh, soul is eternal and our relationship with Krishna is eternal. Right. The, the soul, for the soul there's no birth and there's no death. The soul is eternal. So in this way, Maharaj Chitraketu was being instructed to give up his attachment for his dead son. And they, they, they gave the example about commodities. Do you remember the example? We read it yesterday about commodities, just like gold. How did, they, how did, how did Angira and Narada explain it to Chitraketu? Just like we sell gold to somebody else. So the gold doesn't belong to us again, because it was previously with us, but after selling it to others, so, or giving it to others, so it, it is not no more ours, that in that way. Right. Yes, it's giving up, just like you, you have some gold, and then you sell the gold, it's not your gold anymore, you get some money for it, the gold becomes the property of someone else. Or you can use the same example in relation to animals. People buy and sell animals. 
You may have some cows, you may have some even horses or goats or whatever. And so you can sell them. And then they're, they're no longer yours. You give up your attachment to them. So in this way, Angira and Narada want to bring Maharaj Chitraketu to understand what had happened with the death of his son. That, 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 that we, we identify ourselves with these different designations. We think, I am the father of this child, or I am the mother, or this is my mother, this is my father, bodily relationships. But these relationships are very temporary. They're not eternal. And you can see text number six, the <laughs> Prabhupada in the purport gives the example that one may put forward the argument, if the king's son was his enemy, how could the king have so much affection for him? Although it was explained earlier, in an earlier chapter it was explained about the enemy may come in your own family just to give you trouble. Just like one man came to see Prabhupada and he had a child who was born with the Down syndrome. You know, he was not, he was an abnormal child. So the man asked Prabhupada, he said, why is my son like this? Srila Prabhupada, he said to the man, he said, in his previous life, this boy who is now your son, you did business with him and you borrowed money from him and you did not repay him the money. So he was very angry and he, he hated you for it. And now he has come as your son in this form just to give you trouble. So like that, sometimes someone comes as the enemy. Someone is the enemy and they come in your own family just to give you pain, just to make your life miserable. So this example is given in relation to Chitraketu's son, that the boy came, <laughs> but he died early and so the father of course was in great distress because he was so attached to the child. So the boy came just to give you, just to give trouble. And in text number six, Prabhupada writes, I've marked on the, in the purport there, text number six, the laws of nature force him to go to different fathers and mothers just like a consumer commodity that is purchased and sold. Therefore, the so-called relationship of father and son is an arrangement of prakriti or nature. It has no meaning and therefore it is called illusion. All right. And then text 7, he talks about the animal selling the animal. Then in text number 9, then the conversation is brought to a higher level and they mention about the Supreme Lord. Previously, they'd only be speaking at Magyan, but now they bring up the topic of the Supreme Lord. So that it's important to understand that Narada and Angira didn't just want to only give transcendental knowledge. 
but they wanted to give devotion. They wanted to bring Chitraketu to the platform of bhakti. So then they start to speak about the Supreme Lord, not just only about becoming detached, but developing an attachment for the Supreme Lord. We can be detached, we may not have any attachment for the Lord. So we want the Narada and Angira, they want to bring Chitraketu to the devotional platform because it's only on the devotional platform that one can get freed from birth and death and go back to Godhead. The jnani, they can go up to the impersonal platform for some time, they can be liberated, but again they will come back. They won't get, they're, because they're not situated in devotional service, so they won't be properly freed from birth and death. So the, coming to the platform of devotional service is very important. Okay, so we covered up the text 10 yesterday, right? Then text 11 goes on with Narada speaking about the Lord and describing the qualities of the Lord. The, I'll read the verse, the Supreme Lord, the creator of cause and effect, does not accept the happiness and distress that result from fruitive actions. He is completely independent of having to accept a material body. And because he has no material body, he is always neutral. The living entities, being part and parcel of the Lord, possess his qualities in a minute quantity. Therefore, one should not be affected by lamentation. So in this way, Narada Muni is arguing, he wants to convince Maharaj Chitraketu that there's no need to lament. Of course, already he brought his dead son back to life and the boy had spoken to him and told the father that I'm not coming back with to you that I finished my time in your family, now I'm going some other place. So that's a way of material nature. Even within the life, young people will leave the home, go away from the mother and father. They may be born in the family, but it doesn't mean they'll stay there forever. They often leave home. All right, some points in the purport I've marked, just for your attention. So because he is the Ishwara, meaning he is the supreme controller, he is not affected by duality. It may therefore be said that he sits in the core of everyone's heart as a neutral witness of the causes and effects of one's activities, good and bad. We should also understand that udasina, neutral, does not mean that he takes no action. Rather, it means that he is not personally affected. So these are important points to understand. And Prabhupada goes on to explain, he gives the example about the court judge, that the judge is neutral. But sometimes some person will be rewarded and some person will be punished. It's not that he's giving everyone the same result. According to what they deserve, someone is punished and someone is rewarded. And so the Lord also, as a super soul, acts in a similar manner. So at the end of the purport, then Prabhupada describes how we should act in the material world. He said, one should act, execute one's devotional duty and for the results of one's actions, one should be 
dependent upon the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So we have to work, we have to act, but we have to depend on the Lord. We cannot think we are the doer, independent of Him. Ultimately, everything is done under His direction, under His control. All right, and then Sukadeva Goswami goes on describing the, the conditioned soul. He describes how Maharaj Chitraketu's son had come back to life, but then he left again. He didn't stay. He came back for some time just to give some instruction, just to make it clear to Maharaj Chitraketu that he was going and he was taking another body. The foolish materialistic people, they think at the time of death everything is finished. But death is simply the change of body. So Narada and Angira, they brought that dead boy back to life and had him speak just to convince Maharaj Chitraketu that the boy was simply changing his body. Nothing more than that. It wasn't that he was actually dying, because the soul never dies. But he was simply taking another body according to his karma. And karma moves under the will of the, the Supreme Lord. So, seeing that boy come back to life and speak, everyone was astonished. And their attachment to the material body was cut and they became uh, proper, they became situated on the platform of proper knowledge. They stopped their lamentation and then they performed the funeral cer ceremony for the dead child. Uh, and they gave up their affection. Although it's very difficult, although it was difficult, but with the help of the transcendental knowledge through the mystic power of Narada and Angira, that they could bring the dead boy back to life who could speak transcendental knowledge to Chitraketu and his wife, they gave up their lamentation. And even the co-wives who had poisoned the child described here in text 14, they were very ashamed and they lost all their bodily luster. And they remembered the instructions of Angira and they gave up their ambition to bear a child. Then they went to the banks of the Yamuna where they bathed and atoned for their sinful activities. So very important, you do something sinful like that, somehow, not actually intentionally, but somehow you become implicated in something sinful like this. So you have to do atonement and the proper atonement is the practice of Krishna Consciousness. There's no other atonement which can take away that sin of killing a child other than the practice of Krishna Consciousness. And Prabhupada explains like this, you can see in the purport I've marked, he says, first of all, any woman who has ever performed such an infamously sinful act must atone for it. But no one now is doing that. So many people are doing abortions, but they're not doing atonements. They don't think there's anything wrong with it. They don't realize how it's very sinful. And Prabhupada goes on saying, under the circumstances, the women responsible must suffer in this life and the next. Those who are sincere souls 
after hearing this incident, should refrain from such child killing and should atone for their sinful activities by taking to Krishna consciousness very seriously. If one chants Hare Krishna Maha Mantra without offence, all of one's sinful actions are surely atoned for immediately. But one should not commit such deeds again, for that is an offence. So very serious instruction is being given by Srila Prabhupada there that if somebody has done this kind of thing like abortions then you have to atone for it and the proper atonement is to very seriously practice Krishna consciousness. So then text 15 describes, Maharaj Chitru came out of the dark well of family life. He became fully aware of spiritual knowledge. So he came to the platform of spiritual life. He, he was awakened to the real purpose of life. And then text 16 describes, he bathed in the waters of the Yamuna, he performed oblations. Recording in progress. He, he offered oblations to the forefathers and the demigods and he offered respects and obeisances to the sons of Lord Brahma, namely Angira and Narada. So then Narada had promised he would give him this mantra. So Chitraketu was now a surrendered soul and Narada wants to give him instructions. Maharaj, you, you are muted Maharaj, oh. you are microphone. Krishna, okay. Where is it? Okay, you can hear me now? Yes, Maharaj. Now we can hear. Okay, so we're talking about Maharaj Chitraketu, how he came to the platform of knowledge and he's ready to get instruction from Narada Muni. So here's the mantra, text. 18 and 19, if you're wondering what mantra he was chanting. So it's there in text 18 and 19. You want to chant some mantras? It's a nice mantra to chant. <laughs> you want, maybe you want to see Lord Sankarshan also. Of course, that's not the desire of the mantra, but the mantra is offering respects to the Supreme Lord. Uh, in the purport, Prabhupada talks about the Purusha avatars. He says that well, he's describing the the hierarchy in the spiritual world, right? Be, you have Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Now Vasudeva, Vasudev is an expansion of Narayan. Narayan expands himself as Prajumna. No, no, Vasudeva expands himself as Prajumna. And Vasudeva is an expansion of Narayan. And Aniruddha and Sankarshan. Sankarshan, from Sankarshan comes a second 
Narayana expansion. And from this Narayana comes further expansions. Vasudev, Prajumna, Sankashan and Aniruddha. And the Sankashan in this group is the original cause of the three Purusha avatars. So at the top you have Lord Krishna and then Lord Krishna expands himself as Lord Balaram and then Lord Balaram expands himself as Vasudev. Or Vasudev is an expansion of Narayan. So Narayan is non different from Lord Vishnu or Lord Krishna. And you have the Chatur Vyuha, you have the, the four personalities who represent Lord Narayan, Pajumna, Aniruddha, Vasudev, and Sankarshan. You have two of these chapter viewers. First one from the Sankarshan comes a second Narayan expansion. And then from that Narayan comes further Vasudev, Sankarshan, Aniruddha, and Prajumna. And then from that uh, from that Sankarshan in that group you get the three Purusha avatars, Mahavishnu, Garbhodakashaya Vishnu, and Shirodakashaya Vishnu. And that Shirodakashaya Vishnu, he is the cause of all the incarnations within the universe. All the Recording in progress. Hare Krishna, I'm, I'm going to close down my camera. It might help the connection. It might help my connection to be more stable. Here in Mayapur, back in Mayapur today, it's a bit difficult. All right, so we were talking about Shirodakashai Vishnu. And Shirodakashai Vishnu is described. And it, it Prabhupada describes it from Shirodakashai Vishnu, all the incarnations of the Lord come from him within the universe. When the Lord incarnates in the universe, they come from Shirodakashai Vishnu. Are there any questions on, in relation to this? Well, Maharaj, yes, uh, in different places it is written Vasudev Sankarsan Pradyumna Anirudh, but uh, the, the chronology of the order is not maintained uh, throughout. So here it is Vasudev Pradyumna Sankarsan Anirudh. Is there any relevance in no, this order? No difference. No. They each have different functions, so. Like Sankarshan, he is the lord of the false ego. Aniruddha, he is concerned with the mind. They each have different functions. You can read 
of the third canto, Kapila Shiksha, chapter 26, which describes the function of Aniruddha Prajumna Vasudeva and Sankashan. The, the, the order is not important. But there are two Chaturvyuhas. There's the first one comes after Lord Sankashan, then you have the Chaturvyuha. And then you have another expansion of Sankashan, and then you have another Chaturvyuha. So, like that, two Chaturvyuhas. And each Chaturvyuha is Vasudev Sankashan. Aniruddha and Prajumna. And they are all Vishnu Tattva. They are all engaged in the service of the Lord. But they are all Vishnu Tattva. So at the end of the purport, Prabhupada writes more about the Lord. how he is able to see his, all the different parts and parcels of his body, how they're different from another part. Krishna can see with his eyes and Krishna can see without his eyes. Therefore, in the Sweta Svatara Upanishad, it is said, Pashyat, Pashyati Akchakshush. He can see with his hands and legs. He does not need a particular bodily part to perform a particular action. Angami yasya shakalendriya vritimanti. He can therefore, he can, he can, he can do anything he desires with any part of his body. And therefore, he is called Almighty. Right? Any one of his senses can perform the actions of any of the other senses. So he can eat with his eyes, he can hear with his tongue, he can, you know, eat, any of the senses can perform any of the actions of the other senses. And Prabhupada said here, he can see with his eyes. He can also see with his hands and with his legs. He doesn't, he doesn't need his eyes to see. He can see without his eyes. That's a unique... And he can hear without his ears. He can... His senses are not like our senses. So he has a spiritual body. Going ahead to text 20, more offering prayers to the Lord, as instructed by Narada. So text 21 said, the material names and forms are not applicable to, to the Lord. One who is entirely spiritual, beyond the conception of gross and subtle forms. The impersonal Brahman is another of his forms, may be by his pleasure protect us. And so like this he's praying to the Lord. Then text 22, they give the famous example about the pots and the air in the pot merging with the, all the air outside. So in this way, the Supreme Lord is the cause of Brahman. And then the Supreme Brahman is described. That's in text 23. In text 24, an example was given, 
An example is get iron has the power to burn when made red hot. In the same way, the body, senses, living force, mind and intelligence, they can function in their activities. Which text am I on? Twenty four. Twenty four. Thank you. My net, my connection is not very stable. So he gives the example about the iron and the fire, how it becomes red hot like the fire. So the same way. As iron cannot b burn unless heated by fire, the bodily senses cannot act unless favoured by the Supreme Brahman. Without the help of the Supreme Brahman, the living entity cannot do anything. So in this way, Chitra Ketu is offering prayers to the Lord. He received the mantra from Narada Muni and now he's offering prayers to Lord Sankashan. He had been given instruction by Narada and Angira and now he's offering prayers to the Lord. So then text 26, we hear how Narada leaves. He's given the mantra, he's given the spiritual knowledge to Chitra Ketu. Now he's leaving him and he's going back to his abode in Brahmaloka, up in the top of the universe. Both Narada and Angira go. And Sukadeva Goswami describes that Maharaj Chitraketu has been instructed fully in the prayer. And he was fully instructed because he was fully surrendered. So because of his surrender, Guru was very pleased with him, gave him all the knowledge explained everything to him. And the purport Prophet writes, he was awakened to the platform of renunciation by instructions regarding the falsity of this material world and material possessions. It is only at this stage that bhakti yoga can be instructed. As long as one is attached to material enjoyment, bhakti yoga cannot be understood. This is an important point here to understand in this pastime with Chitra Ketu and Narada and Angira, why they didn't instruct Chitra Ketu more in the beginning because he was so attached to having a child. He was so blinded by his material desires, so they didn't instruct him. But with the death of the child, then they took the opportunity to come and see Chitra Ketu and to try to enlighten him, to get him out of his attachment. Right. We were hearing yesterday 
four reasons why people surrender to Krishna. So distress is very common. When people are in distress, then they want, they're looking for something, they come and surrender to Krishna. Prabhupada writes in the purple here, the Krishna consciousness movement is progressing successfully in the Western countries at the present moment because the youth in the West have received the this, this stage of vairagya or renunciation. They are practically disgusted with material pleasure from material sources. And this has resulted in the population of hippies dis, uh, throughout the Western countries. And Prabhupada said, now if these young people are instructed about bhakti yoga, Krishna consciousness, the instructions will certainly be effective. And it'll be effective. Why? Because they're already detached from the material world. They're, they're not optimistic about the material world. They're only pessimistic. Devotees should be pessimistic about this material world. We don't think there can be any real successful condition here in the material world. Prabhupada writes in the purport also, advancement in devotional service or Krishna consciousness is characterized by increasing renunciation of material enjoyment. Right? That's advancement in Krishna consciousness. Increasing renunciation of material enjoyment. Giving up the material things. That is the sign of our, our real devotion, our real desire to culti cultivate Krishna consciousness. So then text 27 describes how Chitraketu, for one week he chanted with great care and attention the mantra given by Narada Muni. So he's chanting the prayer and after one week only of repeatedly practicing the mantra, then Chitraketu, he achieved the, the rule of the planet of the Vijadharas as an intermediate product of his spiritual advancement in knowledge. So this is the success of Chitraketu. <laughs> Didn't take him long. It took Dhruva Maharaj six months to see God. And he was doing great tapasya, he was also chanting but it took him six months. Somehow Chidraketu, by the blessings of Narada Muni, he's able to do everything in one week. One week he's able to achieve success and to get the result. He becomes, he becomes the, the ruler of the planet of the Vidyadharas. So Vidya, the planet of the Vidyadharas, it's a higher planet than the earth planet. It's higher up in the solar system. So he was able to go there, to rule there. But you'll hear, he's not very happy when he does go there. Prabhupada writes in the purport, a devotee need not practice yoga, karma or jnana to achieve a successful result. Devotional service alone is competent to bring a devotee all material power. 
A pure devotee, however, is never attached to material power, although he gets it very easily without personal endeavor. Chitraketu received this side benefit of devotional service, which he rigid, rigidly performed in association with the instructions of Narada. So Chitraketu, he, he got mercy, he was able to get association with Narada Muni. And Narada Muni gave him a powerful mantra and he followed, he did everything he was meant to and he got success. So 29 goes on to describe, thereafter, within a few days, by the influence of the mantra that Chitraketu had practiced, his mind became increasingly enlightened in spiritual progress and he attained shelter at the lotus feet of Anantadev. Jai. Who else wants shelter at the lotus feet of Anantadev? Anybody else? No. I'm... Yes, Shivaji. Shivaji. Huh? Shivaji. Shivaji. Shivaji wants shelter at the lotus feet of Saint Yes, Maharaj. I don't know. He will uh, later to please explain that he is his god brother, and he will be um, just uh, reading. I mean, humor, giving humor to humorous talk to. That's why Parvati will be passing. Okay. Okay, so anyway, he got shelter at the lotus feet of Ananta Dev. So you chant the mantra properly, you get results. Prabhupada writes in the purport. Nothing in devotional service is material. Everything is spiritual. Consequently, a devotee is awarded so-called material opulence for spiritual advancement. To op oh, this opulence is an aid to help the devotee advance towards the spiritual kingdom. Thus, Maharaj Chitraketu renamed, uh, renowned, thus Maharaj Chitraketu remained in material opulence as a Vidyadharapati, master of the Vidyadharas. And by executing devotional service, he became perfect within a very few days and returned home back to Godhead, taking shelter of the lotus feet of Lord Shesha, Ananta. So this is what's happening to Chitra Ketu. You see, nothing is a waste of time. So Maharaj Chitra Ketu He'd been chanting, he was attached, he had difficulty, he was attached, but the Lord arranged that Narada and Chitraketu would be there to help him. So with that association, Maharaj Chitraketu is making great advancement, it's becoming a nice devotee, where you're going to hear more. Maharaj Lord, uh, Maharaj, I'm sorry to... Yes, what? Maharaj Lord says Ananta, he is uh, Sankarsan and Vritrasra also centers under Sankarsan. Yes, uh, an Ananta Shesha. There's 
Sada Shiva. Uh, let me see. Um, the, there's, uh, you can see Ananta and you can see Ananta Shesha. The same. So that can, uh, we can understand that Sankarshan. Yes. So Bhutrasra had also sheltered under Sankarshan. Who? Bhutrasura. Had ultimately uh, sheltered under the lotus feet of Lord Sankarshan. Sankarshan? Uh, Maharaj uh, Bhutrasura, Bhutrasura. Dhritarashtra. Dhritarashtra. Vrita, Vrita Sura. Yeah. Vrita Sura, yes. Vrita Sura wants to get the shelter of Lord Sankarshan. He's going to go back to Godhead. Because he's been instructed in Sankarshan because he's been associating with Narada Muni. Narada Muni was his guru, remember. So Narada Muni told him about Lord Sankarshan. And give him a mantra to worship Saint Lord Sankarshan. He could see Lord Sankarshan. In this way, he becomes a devotee of Sankarshan. Association. arranged for him to get connected to Lord Sankarshan because Narada Muni had been, been worshipping Lord Sankarshan. So he brought also Angira, uh, he brought Maharaj Chitraketu to worship Lord Sankarshan. Right? Okay. Association, you associate with somebody, you know, somebody's in Delhi and they associate with devotees there, naturally they'll be devoted to Gopal Krishna Goswami or Lokana Swami or somebody else is in Mayapur, naturally they'll be attached to Jaipataka Swami Maharaj, you know, because they're devotees who are for a long time. They've been working in, the, in, in, in this area. And so when the, when the holiday comes, when the festival comes, then we should help them. Help them to get to know the senior devotees and to introduce them. Just like, you know, you arrange for people, maybe you brought them to Krishna consciousness and then you introduce them to your spiritual master so that they can get initiation. That's often a common procedure. You'll introduce the people you, you've made devotees, you'll introduce them to your guru so they can become devotees, they can get initiation from your guru. <laughs> it's a common thing. So here you have Lord Sankarshan and they're introducing the devotees there they want to introduce all the devotees to Lord Sankarshan. Let them all get initiated by Lord Sankarshan. So Prabhupada writes, By worshipping Lord Vishnu, one can get whatever he desires. But a pure devotee never asked Lord Vishnu for any material profit. Instead, he serves Lord Vishnu without material desires and is therefore ultimately transferred to the spiritual kingdom. In this regard, Srila Virag Vira Raghava Acharya comments, by worshipping Vishnu, a devotee can get whatever he likes. Maharaj Chitraketu only wanted to return home back to Godhead and therefore he achieved success in that way. 
Right? That's the mood of a nice devotee. Okay, that's 29. And then text 30 describes how Maharaj Chitra Ketu goes on to actually see the Lord. He's able to see Mahavishnu or Garbha Dakashai, Shiro Dakashai Vishnu. And text 31 describes, as soon as Maharaj Chitraketu saw the Supreme Lord, he, he was cleansed of all material contamination and situated in his original Krishna consciousness. Being completely purified, he became silent and grave, and because of love for the Lord, tears fell from his eyes, and he offered his obeisances unto the Lord again and again. So in this way, the meeting is described how Lord Shiva met with this person who's going to be his guru, and he's appreciating. And in text 32, Maharaj Chitra Ketu is preparing to respond. Maharaj Chitra Ketu is in ecstasy because he's seeing the Lord. And for a considerable time he was unable to utter any words. All right, then text 33, he begins to offer prayers, which is the personification of the Holy Scripture, like the Brahma Samhita and the Narada Pancharatriki. And who is the original, who is the spiritual master of all? He offered his prayers as follows. So, offering prayers is for the liberated souls. Difficult for us to compose meaningful prayers to glorify the Lord. Prabhupada said, devotees do not offer prayers to the Lord in an imaginary form. The existence of the Lord's forms is supported by all Vedic literatures. So we worship the Lord in the authorized form. May it should be stone or metal or it may be paint or it may be wood or it may be, it may be uh, some kind of abrasive something, something to rub the skin, to bring back the consciousness. So devotees don't offer prayers to the Lord just based on some imaginary form. It has to be the real form. All right, then 34 is the beginning of Maharaj Chitra Ketu's prayers offered to the Lord. And there, there's about 15, I think it's 15 verses. I think it goes up to about text 49 and then text 50 is the, the, verse, the prayers are finished. 
So we'll take a break now for 10 minutes. Let's have a break. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Okay, so we're on text number 34, the beginning of Maharaj Chitraketu's prayers. And the prayers go for 15 verses. So I want to know, I would I'd like to hear from you, what are his prayers about? What is he asking the Lord? Usually when people make a prayer, there'll be some kind of request. So, is there any request there in Maharaj Chitra Ketu's prayers? Have you read the prayers? We can ask some lady, some messages. Vrindavan, Vrindavan Sundari Mataji. Vrindavan Sundari Mataji, have you read Chitraketu's prayers? Can you tell us what he's praying for? Vrindavan Sundari Mataji, are you there? Recording in progress. Mainly to, about the bodily senses, the difference, and how he can control the mind and his body. Okay. Was there any request there in the prayers? Did he ask for anything? Um, not. No, he didn't really ask for any request. Okay. What about... Maybe. Yeah? Go ahead, Madhuji. What about Ramcharan Prabhu? Ramcharan. Ramcharan Prabhu, are you there? Recording in progress. Material contamination. I'm sorry, Prabhu, I, I couldn't hear it. Could you say it again? Uh, as per my understanding, uh, he requested to get free from the material contamination. Okay. Yeah, that's certainly a nice thing to pray for. What about Ananta Krishna? You have any remembrances from the prayers, Chitraketu's prayers? Is he asking for anything? Um, sorry, I could not see that he asked for anything actually, but <clears throat> he was just also asking for, uh, speaking about the glories of the Holy Name. The glories of the Holy Name? Yeah, in one verse he was speaking about the Holy Name that he 
uh, wants to, um, uh, yeah, that the Holy Name purifies him and that he needs nothing else but the Holy Name. Okay. And, yeah. Was that the Holy Name of Sankarshan or any special name was mentioned? Oh, I, have, I don't know in which... It's just that the whole... Where is it? May I believe by hearing the holy name of your Lordship only once even Shandala's men of the lowest class are freed from material contamination. Under these circumstances, who will not be freed from material contamination simply by seeing you? So, but there was no particular holy name. But it mentioned only once, right? That yeah. It, so that was something very special. He mentioned even you ch just simply chant the name once. Yeah, purely. Probably if you chant in a pure, in a pure, then everything will happen. But unless that will happen, as we see when we chant, we don't see the complete purification for our contamination. So. Probably means when it, when we come to the stage of Shudanam, then immediately everything will be purified mm -hmm. or killed. Yeah, good. What about Govinda Dev? I'm not hearing you, Prabhu. You must be muted. Oh, I'm sorry, Maharaj. Yes. So he was very specifically praying the Lord to relieve him of all contaminations, to fix his, fix his mind upon the lotus feet of the Lord and to help him increase in devotional practices to achieve the ultimate destination of life. So he had not made any specific prayer regarding, uh, regarding uh, gaining of material opulence or anything else. But as a byproduct, he was uh, given the benefit of becoming Vidya Dharpati which is a byproduct uh, of his devotional practices. Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so Prabhupada writes in the purport there, text 34, the Lord and the devotee both conquer. The Lord is conquered by the devotees and the devotees are conquered by the Lord. So that kind of transcendental reciprocation is there. And then later on in the purport, Prabhupada writes, because they serve the Lord without desires for remuneration, they can conquer the mercy of the Lord. The Lord is by nature very merciful. And when he sees that his servant is working without desires for material profit, naturally he is conquered. All right, so there are many nice prayers offered by Chitra Ketu. Another point here, text number 39. Whether at the end of the purport, whether for the satisfaction of material desires, because of the influence of envy, because of fear, because of affection, or because of any other reason, if one comes to Krishna consciousness, his life is successful. So what doesn't matter what region you come for, but if you've come to Krishna, that's the success. And then in text 40, in the purport, Prabhupada said, he can, he can understand the difference between life without Bhagavata Dharma and life with Bhagavata Dharma. And thus, he never remains obliged to the, to the Lord. And thus, he, 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 he ever remains obliged to the Lord, taking to Krishna consciousness. 
taking to Krishna consciousness and bringing fallen souls to Krishna consciousness is victory for Lord Krishna. And then text 41, Bhagavad Dharma means following the orders given by the Supreme Lord, Bhagavan, as stated in Bhagavad Gita, Sarva Dharmam Paragyajna. So we have to understand what is the meaning of Bhagavad Dharma. It means to surrender to Krishna, taking shelter of Krishna, giving up all material religion. And then at the end of the purport, Prabhupada discusses the supreme position of Bhagavad Dharma. He said, Where, whereas so-called religions are meant for a particular type of person who believe in a particular way, such discrimination has no place in Krishna consciousness or Bhagavad Dharma. If we scrutinize the religious systems meant for worship of demigods or anyone else but the Supreme Personality of Godhead, we will find that they are full of envy and therefore impure. So there are many different paths, different faiths, different religious processes, and they're all uh, describing a particular way in which we can approach to God or we can approach to the path of spiritual perfection. But if we study them closely, we will see that there's always some kind of imperfection there, some impurity, some envy. At one point I was working with some people who were from the Mormon tradition. Have you ever heard of Mormons? It's a, an American uh, form of Christianity, a modern day Christianity. They talk about the latter day saints. So Mormon, Mormon church. So <laughs> This, this one, one American man who I was with, he said, I know we have a real religion. I said, why? He said, we don't drink tea or coffee. He said, this is a real religion because we don't drink tea or coffee. I said, yes, that's good. You don't drink tea or coffee, but you eat everything. He said, oh yeah. He said, I like, oh, I eat everything. <laughs> he he didn't he didn't think there should be any discrimination about what he eats. He was proud that he didn't take tea or coffee though. And you get in, in this way you get different traditions. They have different they have some good points somewhere here and there, but they they have so many faults also. And Prabhupada said, when we talk to Christians, he said, unless they agree that they shouldn't eat meat, he said, there's no point to go any further in the discussion. He said, they have to admit that meat eating is not necessary. If they won't agree to that, then don't waste your time discussing any other philosophy with them. It's not worth it. Okay, so there's some interesting purports. Here at the end of 42, the purport of 42, Prabhupada writes, following a system of religion that does not awaken one's God consciousness or Krishna consciousness 
is merely a waste of time and labor. Right? You, there's some verses in the Bhagavatam to support that, right? Do you know a verse in the Bhagavatam to support this? Yes, Ramachandra Prabhu? What would be a verse in the Bhagavatam which says that if we don't... Dharma Sunnishtita Pungsha Vishokhena Kathashiva Na Yadi Utpadeya Tirati Samma Evai Kevalam Yes, what's the translation? Uh, if uh, Krishna consciousness is not awakened in one's heart, the uh, individual uh, efforts made are all wasted of time. Mm. Yes, duties executed by all men are only so much use, useless labor if we don't develop God consciousness. So how do you know you, how do you know you're developing God consciousness? Vrindavan, Sundari, how do you know when you're developing God consciousness? By uh, we have more attachment for the Lord and doing more service, devotional service to the Lord. Yep. And less less attached uh, and more detached to material activity. Yes, less interest in the mundane world, right? You don't watch the Bollywood movies, right? You're finished yeah. with, you, you don't waste your time with mundane affairs because you're in Krishna consciousness. Maharaj, there is also a verse in Srimad Bhagavad the 8th canto, 8th chapter. Lakshmi Devi uh, uh, says that verse that uh, um, if there is no Bhuta Saurda, what is that religion? If there is no um, compassion to the animals, so what is that religion? In that way, he uh, says. Yeah, the, if, if we're not compassionate to the animals, of course, we should be compassionate not only to the animals, to all living entities. Yes, so that is said about Bhuta or the Bhuta Sauda means all the living entities. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Hmm. So then 40, in text 43, Chitra Ketu goes on to speak, about, after speaking about the importance of Bhagavad Dharma, now he's speaking, how are you going to get this Bhagavad Dharma? You have to study Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita. Our duty, our, our duty to follow Bhagavad Dharma is by studying scriptures like Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. And then he brings up about, he says, the Aryans, such Aryans worship you, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So Prabhupada writes at the end of the purport, we are spreading the Krishna consciousness movement to try to establish a society the way that Krishna wants it. This is the meaning of Krishna consciousness. We are therefore presenting Bhagavad Gita as it is and kicking out all, all kinds of mental concoction. So devotees in the Krishna consciousness movement, we're always trying to distribute books like Bhagavad Gita. A devotee was just telling me today how he went to Ayodhya for the opening of the Rama temple at the birthplace of Lord Ram. And he said they had a, the, a booth there and they were distributing Bhagavad Gita. And they would distribute it in an interesting way. 
they would give it with two other books, two small books, and they would distribute the small books and they would ask only 50 rupees for the two small books and they would give a free Bhagavad Gita with it. And so he said in this way, he said they were distributing sets of books, three books, two small books with the Bhagavad Gita. He said they would do up to 8,000 and 9,000 books in, in one day at this Rama temple. And he said every day they were also distributing very good prasadam for everyone. 10,000 plates a day and about eight, 9,000 sets of books. So <laughs> that's Krishna consciousness. Giving books to people, let them read the book. Of course, giving the book is only the beginning. You have to read the book with them. You have to train them what's in the book. So we have also that Gita Gyan course. The Bangalore devotees, they have a very good program with PowerPoint presentation. They study the Bhagavad Gita at different levels and they present a chapter a day. And each day for one hour, they'll cover one chapter of Bhagavad Gita. And then thousands of people have taken this course and studied the Bhagavad Gita. So there's a need for this kind of education and our movement is fulfilling that need. Getting people to read the books and understand them. So you see Maharaj Chitraketu talking about the importance of studying the books. All right, then he talks about material contamination. And he said, you, we can get freed from material contamination simply by seeing the Lord, simply by seeing the... And this is, of course, what Narada Muni is offering him. You, you chant this mantra and in seven days you will see the Lord. And so simply by hearing the holy name, one is immediately purified. Men who are considered to, be, to belong to the lower class of being are delivered from all sinful activities by chanting the holy name. What is important in performing this devotional service? Humility. We have to have some humility, we have to consider ourselves unqualified and unworthy and very fortunate that we've been given the opportunity to chant the holy name. And seeing the deity, similarly coming to see the deity, we should have that kind of humility also. We should go to the temple to be seen. Not to see, but to be seen. We cannot see the Supreme Lord with our, pres with our present blunt eyes. The Lord has kindly consented to come before us in a form we can see. And of course that form, that is the Deity. So we learn to serve the deity. Serving the deity is non-different from serving the Lord in Vaikuntha. There's no difference. All right, and then huh. there's more glorification of the Lord. All right, so the prayers are finished in 40, uh, verse 48. Then Sukadev Goswami continues. 
how Lord Ananta Dev is very pleased with the prayers offered by Chitra Ketu. And now he's going to reply. Lord Ananta Dev is going to reply to him. And what's he going to, how is he going to express himself? What does Lord Ananta Dev have to tell Chitra Ketu? Yes, Govinda Dev, do you know? Uh, so actually, uh, yes, I had not thoroughly precipitated my understanding, but uh, yeah, um, yes, yeah. so he is averring him that you are very well aware of the transcendental knowledge what was imparted to you and you just uh, make yourself confident of practicing devotional services and ultimately you will release the transcendental feature of uh, a, a devotional service and ultimately will achieve the highest destination of life. That hard I do formulate, but exactly. Yes, how is it he was able to see the Lord? By the mercy of the great sages Narada and Angira. And the Lord is recognizing that. He knows it was by the grace of Narada and Angira that Chitra Ketu had come to him and that Chitra Ketu is now pure. And he is able, he's so pure that he's able to see the Lord face to face. So this is his good fortune. Then in 51, he says, there are two forms, right? There are two forms. There is the transcendental sound, and there is also the deity. So the, the Lord appears, sometimes, sometimes we will say, the Lord will say he appears in two forms. He comes in the form of the spiritual teacher as well as in the deity. Here it says he comes in the form of the holy name. The, the Lord himself says, I am the form of the transcendental vibration. I am the supreme absolute truth. So these two forms of mind, namely the transcendental sound and the eternal blissful spiritual form of the deity are my eternal forms. They are not material. They are not material, but of course, we may have material understanding. Just like when we worship the Lord, we may, see, we may simply worship the Lord. We may not appreciate that the Deity is actually the Lord. There's a story how the one boy was offering food to the... Well, the father asked his son, the father asked his son to make the offering to the Deity. He said, the deity's been in our family a long time. I want you to make the offering. So the boy did the offering and the, later on the father came and he asked the boy, where's the prasad? And the boy said, oh, the deity ate everything. The father was shocked, could not believe the deity ate everything. So he had the boy make another offering and he was watching from behind the curtain and he saw how the boy was preaching, how the boy was talking to the deity and encouraging the deity to eat. And the man got very upset. He thought, how is it you're only a deity? You sh <laughs> but the deity can eat. The deity is not just some statue. The deity can talk. The deity can walk. The deity can eat. So don't see the deity with material vision. If we do, then we are a resident in hell. You have to understand the deity can see everything. He sees us and he knows our consciousness. We have to be very careful and conscious how we approach the deity and how we worship the deity. 
So deity worship is very important. Rupa Goswami mentions it as in one of his five items. Just by, he said, just by a little attraction to any one of these things, one can get perfection in his spiritual life. And one of them, of course, is to worship the deity. Other people, you can study Srimad Bhagavatam. You can see the Lord in the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam. You read the Srimad Bhagavatam carefully, one day you will see Krishna in the pages of the Bhagavatam. The Srimad Bhagavatam is the incarnation of Krishna in the form of a book. Right? What is the verse? In the Bhag Srimad Bhagavatam, which describes that this Bhagavatam takes the place of Krishna. The, you know, the question is asked in the beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam. Now that Krishna has left his abode, when Krishna was present, he was the personification of all religious principles. But where are the religious principles now, now that Lord Krishna is no longer present? How was that question answered? Yes. Yes, very good. You've learned your slokas. Good. Okay, so there are two forms of the Lord. Oh, there's, uh, when one is actually on the platform of yoga, of vidya, he can personally understand the personality of Godhead in his form, like those of Lord Rama, Lord Krishna, and Sankirshan. So that is the platform of Vidya, knowledge, transcendental knowledge. We want to go above Vidya, we want to come to the platform of Bhakti, and to develop devotion. We don't just want only Vidya, but certainly Vidya is helpful. By cultivating devotional service, we should also be cultivating vidya, right? What's that verse, Govinda Dev? By devotional service, we also cultivate transcendental knowledge and vairagya. Vasudeva Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Prayajitaha Janayati Asu Jnanam Vairagyam Jnanam Ahitukam Yes, that right. means by rendering honorable devotional service upon the lotus feet of Lord Vasudev, automatically and spontaneously detachment and knowledge will manifest. Right, yes. Okay, so Lord Sankarshan is offering, giving instructions to Maharaj Chitraketu here. Is describing here in text 52 how he is the cause of everything, that everything is under his control, it's all his doing, right? Everything rests upon him, meaning the Supreme Lord, and everything is but an expansion of the Lord's energies. But this does not mean that everything is as worshipable as the Lord Himself. That would be foolish. Yes, everything is the, the Lord's, but not everything can be worshipped like the Lord. There's the Lord and His energies, and then there's the material energy, The theory that the Lord's energies, being expansions of the Lord, 
are as good as the Lord is mistaken. We have to understand what is the proper philosophy and what is not. So like this, we're learning from Srimad Bhagavatam. All right, then text 5354, discussing different levels of consciousness, sleep, and then deep sleep, and then unconscious. So he's describing the vision of a person in these different conditions of life, these different consciousness. Someone's in material consciousness, somebody's just dreaming and somebody's in deep, deep sleep. So Prabhupada said, these are all different stages of conditioned life. It's all conditioned life. Whether you're awake or dreaming or deep sleep. We should understand the Supreme Lord is the ultimate actor and the conditioned living entity should always remember this, original actor is Lord Sri Krishna. Our only duty is to remember the Supreme Director of the illusory energy, Lord Krishna. So, text 56, he's describing more about the different levels of consciousness. It's all conditioned life. Without consciousness of the Supreme. But, it's all witnessed by the Super Soul. And the Lord is different from the Super Soul. So Lord Anantadeva is describing about transmigration, how the living entity in conditioned life will give up one body, take another body. That is conditioned life. Conditioned life means going, giving up one body to accept another, undergoing death to accept death again. Of course, the Mayavadi philosopher, they say, you are the same as God. He forgets that taktvam asi applies in terms of the marginal position of the living entity. So then he gives the example about the sunlight, the heat and light in the sun, there's heat and light in the sunshine, and thus they are 
qualitatively one. But one should not forget that the sunshine rests on the sun. As the Lord says in Bhagavad Gita, I am the original source of Brahman. Brahmano hi pratistaham. The sunshine is important because of the presence of the sun globe. It is not that the sun globe is important because of the all-pervasiveness of the sunshine. Forgetfulness, misunderstanding of this fact is called maya. And because of forgetfulness of one's constitutional position and that of the Supreme Lord, one comes into maya or samsara. So like that, Lord Sankarshan is describing the, how the soul, the living entity, is entangled in material existence. But then, in 58, he goes on how he can achieve perfection, how he can become self-realized with the help of the Vedic literature. And he talks about the importance of getting association. that you need to get the association with the, the devotees. You need to get the help from the Krishna consciousness movement. It's the only thing which can bring us out of conditioned life. In text 60, husband and wife, man and woman, plan together to attain happiness and decrease unhappiness, working jointly in many ways, but because their activities are full of desires, these activities are never a source of happiness and they never diminish distress. On the contrary, they are a cause of great unhappiness. That is material existence. It's the cause of suffering. We're planning eternal happiness in the material world. You can never have it. We have to understand the nature of the material world. So, Anantadeva is bringing out this point to Maharaj Chitraketu. He knows what happened to Maharaj Chitraketu. He knows how he had a son and the son died untimely. So he's reminding him of the nature of the material world. And Anant, Lord Anantadev continues talking about the spiritual position of the soul, how the soul is always transcendental. So the living entity's duty is to give up all kinds of desires which he may be carrying in his mind. And text 63 describes there's no better truth to understand the Supreme Lord and our relationship with Him. How we're one in quality but different in quantity. This is the ultimate understanding. So Lord Ananta Dev assures the king 
that if you understand all of this knowledge which I've arranged, which I've been giving to you, then you will achieve the highest perfection. You will become an eternal associate of Lord Sankarshan. And of course that was the desire of Vritasura. He just desired to have that eternal association of Lord Sankarshan. So, final verse, Sukadeva Goswami said, After thus instructing Chitraketu and assuring him of perfection in this way, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the Supreme Spiritual Master, the Supreme Soul, Sankarshan, disappeared from that place as Chitraketu looked on. So Chitraketu has become the king of the Vijadharas and we will hear what happens in chapter 17, how he gets cursed by Mother Parvati and that's how he became Vritasura and that's how Vritasura, although he was killed by Indra, he was a great devotee. Alright, so we have two more classes to finish this unit. So, we'll try to finish it. two more classes. Are there any questions on chapter 16? Anyone? Uh, Maharaj, yeah, our moment is Krishna Consciousness moment. So we have pleased to uh, practice Krishna Consciousness because the Krishna Consciousness is the ultimate destination of our civilization. So all the human beings are lawfully bound, constitutionally bound to render services of Lord Krishna. But all these conceptions like uh, Sankarshan, Ananta Dev, all these are in the meantime, those are also introduced to all these different chapters. Uh, how can we understand? Because we should achieve Krishna, which is ultimate destination of life, emanations eman nations of all incarnations and is full of whole potency, the complete whole, Supreme Personality of Godhead, but Shankarshan, Narayan, all these conceptions are related to Vaikuntha planet. So, because these are the, the uh, all these devotees are very highly exalted. So, instead of aspiring Krishna consciousness, meaning to achieve Lord Krishna, why they are uh, yeah, attached to all these uh, features of the Lord? Well, we have to understand not everyone's the same. Not everyone wants to just simply worship Krishna. Some people are more attracted, their worshipable deity is Lord Ramachandra. Just like you are seeing how so many people are going to Ayodhya to worship Lord Ramachandra. They're not interest, so much interested in Krishna, they're more attracted to Lord Ramachandra. And other people are devote, some people are very devoted to Lord Nishingadev. The Lord has so many different forms and devo different devotees are attracted to different features of the Lord. Not everyone is so inspired by the, the, the characteristics and pastimes of Lord Krishna. So everyone has their individual nature and they have their particular devotion, they have their own Ishtadeva. Right? Not everyone's Ishtadeva is Krishna. Now somebody else is a devotee of Lord Rama, somebody's a devotee of Lord Varaha, somebody's a devotee of Lakshmi Narayan. You can't well, you can't expect everyone just to be a follower of Krishna. Krishna comes in many different forms just to satisfy the desires of different devotees. Isn't it true? Yes, Maharaj, but uh, the residents in Vaikuntha world planet, is it quite different from residents in Krishna Lok or Gorolo? Yes, it's different, different ras. In Vaikunth, the rasa is 
mainly Dasharas. But in Golok, it's mainly Madhurya Ras. There's more intimacy and love in Golok. In Vaikuntha, it's more Aishwarya. The mood is more of opulence. That's why Lord Rama's dealing with devotee is different from Lord Krishna. Lord Rama is not Rasaraj. He is he's a king. He's a, or a prince. And he's not like the common people. He's royalty. Lord Krishna plays the part of the coward boy. He's enjoying intimate dealings. So there's a difference between Golok and Vaikuntha. Right? No, yes, not as. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna, on that point, I would have also a question. Yes? Um, when you say Ishtadev, is the Ishtadev then... How to say, if someone is uh, attracted to some form of Krishna and you call it Ishtadev, is this then also their eternal relationship? So if those, you say, who are attracted to Ram, who go to the Ayodhya and all that, and consider themselves practice of Ram, they have some understanding of their eternal relationship with the Lord because they understand, oh, it's Ram, I'm more attracted to him. So it's, they have at least some aspect, a uh, realization of their, uh, their eternal relationship. And it then said some Swarup relation. At least they know Ram, not Krishna or someone else. So, is, it, is this a, just a comment, is it? No, no, it's my question to you. Is, is the Ishtadev, when you speak of Ishtadev and they consider Ram as their Ishtadev, as you say, Ishtadev, does that mean they know I am an eternal devotee, that the soul is eternally connected to Ram? And if we we'll continue uh, their devotion to Ram and we'll realize what kind of the spe specific relationship they have to Ram, but at least they know already it's Ram, it's not Krishna, it's not this or that. that so that's my question to you. Yes, yeah, so, well, of course, if they're pure devotees, their mood is simply to be the servant. Well, Lord Rama is a master and they, their mood is the servant. They simply see Lord Rama as their worshipable king. Oh, of course, they can also see him as God. They can think of him as God. He is. He's, he's one of the, the avatar of Lord, the Lord. But for, for his devotees, they will th certainly think of him in that way. And there's nothing Something. wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that when we now chant Hare Krishna and we understand Krishna is our Lord, we, we will definitely go to Krishna, not someone else. Even though now in our beginning stage we chant Hare Krishna, we, we, would, we would like Krishna most, more than Ram or Nusimhadev. So we will go to Krishna. We just don't know if our relationship will be in Shanta, Sakya, whatever other Ras, but at least we know it's already Krishna. That it will not be that we continue our spiritual life and suddenly we realize, oh, it's, it's Ram or it's Narayan. So this is already because of our, right, right now we have this attraction towards Krishna, so this will just specify, but the direction is already clear, because we're Krishna Bhaktas. Well, we're not only Krishna Bhaktas, we're also Chaitanya Mahaprabhu devotees. We worship Gornitai. The worship of Gornitai is m even more prominent than the worship of Krishna. Wor worship of Krishna is something very special, and with very, requires very high standard. But the worship of Gornitai is very simple, very easily achieved, and very powerful. So we, we like to encourage the worship of Gornitai. It's not that everyone will be a Krishna Bhakta. Now some people may be Krishna Bhaktas, others may be simply I think more people will be following Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And without the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, we cannot go to Radha and Krishna. 
So you, you okay, so but yeah, 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 I understand, I understand. This is quite connected. But if I chant the Hare Krishna, it will not happen that suddenly I will feel attraction towards Narayan. Well, certainly it can happen. It depends how we are chanting. It de depends what is our mood in chanting. Yeah, we all have a, a particular rasa, and we don't know exactly. And in our conditioned state, when we haven't fully understood what is our rasa with Krishna. But our rasa may be in that mood of dasya ras. It's not that our rasa has to be madhurya ras. Although generally the followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu were all cultivating the mood of the gopis, we can't expect that everyone is going to be a gopi in the spiritual world. But we can be a servant and we want to cultivate that mood. Therefore Chaitanya Mahaprabhu described Jivaswara Pahai Nitya Krishna Das. The living entity is eternally a servant of Krishna. To try to understand higher rasas, that will take a lot of purification. And when devotees asked Prabhupada about that, Prabhupada said, you don't need that. Said, just chant Hare Krishna, just be the servant. Yeah, yeah, but we chant Hare Krishna and in, in connection to that we study Bhagavatam and we read Krishna book, Prabhupada gave Krishna book. So especially to, to yeah, it is like a uh, dual process for us. No? We chant Hare Krishna and we have the meditation through reading of Prabhupada's books, which are actually very oriented towards Krishna and of course Mahabrabhu. And so in that sense, isn't it all, almost, um, um, well, how to say uh, guaranteed that we reach those those forms of the Lord whom we are reading and chanting about. We chant Hare Krishna, right? I don't chant uh, uh, Om Narayana Namaha or something. We chant Hare Krishna, we read about Krishna. He's very much in the center, of course, with Mahabrabhu. So these two personalities who are the same will be reached also. Hmm. Yeah. Or, yeah, we may be chanting Hare Krishna, but still there's the attitude. Uh, who, what, what, is the, what is the concept of our meditation? What Krishna are we chanting to? Are you chanting to Krishna in Dwarka, or Krishna in Mathura, or Krishna in Vrindavan? Are you chanting yeah. to Lord Rama? Lord Rama's name is also there in the Mahamantra. Somebody may be chanting to Lord Ramachandra, Somebody may be chanting to Lord Balarama. Now someone may also be devotee of Lord Balarama. Lord Balarama is equal to Lord Krishna. Someone may be devotee to Lord Balarama more than Krishna. And someone else may be chanting Rama. He's think, simply thinking of Rama as a name of Krishna. So, so but when, when I chant now Hare Krishna in focus and, and I, 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 I chant to, as you say, I chant to Krishna and Vrindavan. Then I go to Krishna and Vrindavan. Well, you have to be qualified. It's not just you know, having that desire, but the qualification also has to be there. To how is the qualification coming about? Well, it comes about by developing our service attitude. Through service, we can go there. Pure serve, pure loving service. Mm, so, we, we have to have the very strong desire and the, 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 and the, the pure, unmotivated love and the humility also. We, we cannot demand these things. It's up to Krishna. Krishna will arrange what is our situation, what is to be our destination. We are dependent on Him. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, I am the swift deliverer from the ocean of birth and death. 
it's not that we can demand, I want to be in this position, I will go there and, you know, that's not how it works. We have to no, be... No, no, I understand that, yeah, I understand that. But this focus has to be there too, right? As you said, we chant to Krishna and Vrindavan at the same time, we develop the serving mentality, mood, the humility, the purity and all that through the chanting, through the sadhana, through the right attitude and all that. But still in the meditation, there's some certain aspiration in the devotee's mind, consciousness and heart to serve the Lord in, in Vrindavan in that sense, right? Yeah, can be. Of course. Or how, how is Rupa Goswami then defining of what does he mean with the, the uh, Laulian, the greed, that there must be a greed on the Yeah, there has side. to be that, that greed. We have to want so badly that we can cry, that we'll cry for it, that you want it so much. So that Laulian, that is the price. And that, 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 that greediness is manifest by our eagerness to do service, to hear and to chant more and to worship the Lord more. The more we are un, unmotivated and, and, and the more we are uh, absorbed without deviation in His service, then that is a... We must have that pure love, right? The eyes have to develop that love. Put the ointment of prema on our eyes. Then we can actually be qualified to see Krishna. Without having the love for Krishna, we will not see. We can see the deity. We can chant the holy name. It, it may be our chanting is, it may be all right, I don't know. But there are stages in chanting, it takes time. Prabhupada said it took him many years to perfect his chanting. And when you say unmotivated, unmotivated means then we are not motivated by jnana and karma, as Rupa Goswami says. So that means we don't have the desire to get uh, karmic uh, betterment or uh, liberation. So then our devotion is not motivated anymore. And we just want to please the Lord with our like chanting or reading or... Yes, well, yeah, mo the motivation shouldn't be that, you know, we, we're not interested in profit or adoration or distinction. Love, puja and pratishta. We don't want these things. Therefore, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Nada namna janamna sundarim. What does Chaitanya Mahaprabhu want? He says, I, I only want devotional service, birth after birth. He is not even asking for liberation. He simply wants devotional service, birth after birth. That is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mood in Shikshastika. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, so we'll... Uh, uh, Maybe, I'm not sure about next week, I don't know what's happening. The devotee told me something uh, that he said people are busy with Gaur Purnima and may, may not have class next weekend. I don't know. He said we have next weekend uh, the test and um, the day after that there will be free oh, holiday. Oh, okay. So next weekend you're having test and then next... Yeah, Maharaj, CBI had been scheduled on Saturday and uh, Sunday no class. It is informed in the group. Okay, so after two weeks then we'll meet. We, we still have to do two more classes to finish the unit. Okay. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada, Jai. Hare Krishna. Jai. Hare Krishna.
Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank Hare you. Hare Krishna Prabhu.